Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. We are located on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and are interested in hearing of any encounters or sightings from here on the island. If you've had an encounter or sighting, please give us a call or text us your experience at 778-227-7588. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Chilling Sasquatch Reports from Alaska Portlock, Alaska. Teacher and his wife at English Bay stated hunters from Portlock sometimes failed to return. In 1949, hunters were found mutilated. Giant man-like tracks, 18 inches, reported closing in on moose tracks and signs of a struggle. Then only deeper man-like tracks heading for higher mountains. Village abandoned in 1949. Residents afraid to talk about the incidents such as above. Nulato, Alaska. In 1920, Albert Petka died after fighting with a bushman that had attacked him on the boat where he was living. His dogs drove the bushman off, but the man later died. Nelchina Plateau, Alaska. 1930s, in the month of September, the hairy giant Gilliak, also called the Cannibal Giant, killed one of the Indians. His sign was a sapling twisted to shreds. Bristol Bay, Alaska, 1940, near the ghost town of Kaluka, Alaska, Emily Supinich's mother was berry-picking with others when they came upon a large hairy creature that resembled a man covered with long black hair. They ran back to the village and told the people. The men went out, captured it, and caged it. She said her mother fed it raw fish. After some time, the hair began to fall out, and it turned out to be a female with breasts. Not long after the hair started falling out, the creature died. Wrangell Narrows, Alaska, late May 1942. Bob Titmus saw an ape-like thing on the beach while passing in a boat. This was in the late evening before 10 o'clock while it was still light outside. The creature was about 7 feet tall, very heavy, erect, and had dark hair. Wrangell, Alaska, in 1918, a German gold prospector of a stature, half-starved, made his way back to camp from a northernmost mining camp, looking for food and provisions. The story goes that he sat down to pick new sprouts of fireweed plant to eat, which was mixed in a scraggly field of berries. He ate what his stomach could tolerate and fell asleep curled up in a bed of grass with the warm sun on his back. He claimed he was awakened by someone talking nearby. Excited to have company and needing direction to the settlement, he crawled around a high bramble of berry thorns to see who was there. He said he saw a bushwoman sitting on the ground feeding a small one berries by hand. It was sitting inside the circle of her huge legs. The prospector watched only a short time in fear of the giant, but heard the bushwoman talk to the smaller one in Indian language. Wrangell, Alaska. Original year unknown. A fisherman said, as far back as he could remember, there was a story that circulated in his family about a hairy giant that brought a three-year-old girl back to the encampment after she wandered away from her mother. The child had been missing most of the day, but was returned at dusk, completely unharmed in the arms of a male beast, who, it was said, placed her on the ground and walked back into the forest. The little girl had learned to play the game of stickball while away. Near Ruby, Alaska, 1943. John Meyer, known as the Dutchman, was in DeWild's camp, 18 miles down Yukon from Ruby, when attacked. He fought off a hair-covered man, but later died of internal injuries. The creature was run off by dogs. 50 miles southwest of Ketchikan, August 1956. On inside passage, a fish cat being anchored at night, a bear was seen on shore sitting on its rump. It got up, looked at the boat a few seconds, and started to walk away upright like a human. It was about 200 feet away. Bob estimated it was 7 to 8 feet tall and weighed 350 to 400 pounds. It was blackish-reddish color with hair 2 to 3 inches long. Biologists from Ketchikan later found and photographed big human-like prints on the beach that went into a heavily wooded area. Near Ketchikan, Alaska, summer 1960. 
Mrs. Nye's cousin, Errol, then 15 years old, was sent out to haul in a skiff that was tied up to a float at night. Errol left the flashlight pointing in shore. He glanced up and saw a human-like figure standing in the water up to his waist, between the float and the shore watching him. He described it as, not exactly a person, but arms and head like a man. The creature was grayish-white all over and had big, round, beady eyes. The boy screamed and ran. About 30 men rushed out, shone lights, and saw the creature dive under the water and swim away like a frog. Arms forward, overhead, and legs doing a frog kick. Ruby, Alaska, August 1960. Paul Peters was at his fishing camp 10 miles down the Yukon from Ruby when he saw a bushman climb a steep hill by the river and disappear into the bush. The creature walked upright like a man, was quite tall and broad, covered with dark hair. Kobuk River, Alaska, 1966. Gene Joyner of Nome, while at his mine near Doll Creek and Jade Mountain, often found large man-like tracks. One day he finally faced the creature and shot an upright walking bear in the back, killing it. Joyner found the thing looked so human he didn't know what it was. Afraid, he cut it up and threw it in the stream. Bradfield Canal Area, Alaska, July 1969. J.W. Huff of Ward Cove, Alaska, was flown into a prospecting camp about the 2,300-foot range in the late afternoon, during which time he saw a man on a ridge 500 yards away who seemed extremely large and very dark in color, wearing no clothes. Galena, Alaska, summer 1969. Dick Carroll and son reportedly saw the Bushman while constructing a fire line near Bear Creek Drainage near Galena. Near Fort Yukon, Alaska, August 1969. Jim Ward is alleged to have shot at a large hair-covered man while moose hunting. Haynes County, Alaska, February 1994. At the time, there were young local kids but it was winter and they were in the woods, actually really close to downtown Haines, when they saw what they described as a huge, human-like, hairy animal sitting in the snow eating fish. They ran screaming to a neighbor close by, who then went into the woods and saw footprints that were too far apart for him to step in with both feet. And where it was sitting, it made seat marks that could fit two people in with room to spare. Carol Inlet, Ketchikan, Alaska the United States Forest Service had one unusual case of damage to two of their trucks on an isolated logging road system east of Ketchikan in April 2000. The road system was the Shelter Cove logging road system on the west side of Carroll Inlet. The trucks were separated by an air distance of approximately 25 miles, but by an actual driving distance of over 100 miles. Allegedly, one truck and one Suburban were both found one morning with windows smashed in and the roof of one of the vehicles compressed down with an estimated force of a thousand pounds. There were no marks to indicate human involvement, and vandalism was not the official explanation. Officially, the report suggested that the work was that of a bear or bears. But only black bear occur on Ravella, and their weight is rarely in excess of 650 or 700 pounds. Eagle River, Anchorage, 1990, an account from an Alaskan bow hunter. In 1990, while I was working as a paramedic in Anchorage, we got a call out on an alarm for a man having a heart attack at the state jail in Eagle River. He was a native man in his 70s, and after I got him stabilized with IVs, O2, and cardiac drugs, my partner and I began to transport him to the native hospital in Anchorage. En route to the hospital, I had time to talk to this gentleman who was from the native village of Port Graham, a remote village on the lower end of Cook Inlet. Well, as usual with me, the topic eventually drifted to hunting and fishing, and I casually mentioned to him that I and two other hunting buddies were once weathered in at the upper lagoon of Dogfish Bay, only a few miles from his home in Port Graham. The lagoon was about as beautiful and wild a place as I'd ever seen in my 35 years in Alaska. Well, when I said that I had spent some time in dogfish, 
The old man sat up on his gurney and grabbed me by the front of my shirt. He got right up in my face and said, Did it bother you? Well, with that question, the hair just stood up on the back of my head. I said, Yes. Did you see it? was his next question. I said, No. Did you see it? He said, No, but my brother seen it. It chased him. This old man and I were talking about the same thing, but we never used the word Bigfoot or legend or anything like that. But we both knew what we were talking about. You see, in August of 1973, three of us were bow hunting for goats and blackies in what was then the remote wilderness of Lower Cook Inlet when a storm forced us to take shelter in Dogfish Bay Lagoon. We beached our skiff and let the tide run her dry. After a dinner of broiled salmon, we turned into our tent. Back in those days, the best tent I had was a dark green canvas job with a center pole and no windows or floor. We left the fire burning and cleaned the pots and pans so as to not attract bears during the night and turned in. The sky was clear, but the wind was howling through the old-growth timber that lined the shore. Sometime around 2 a.m., my friend Dennis woke me up by squeezing my leg. I could dimly see his face in the tent. His finger was across his lips. I listened. Then I heard it. A step. A man was quietly walking outside of our tent, taking very deliberate steps. Not a bear. Scenes from the movie Deliverance flashed through my mind. We woke Joe, the third member of our party, with the same leg grab and finger to the lips. The walking, or rather sneaking, continued until it half-circled our tent, and then all was quiet except for the wind. We had our bows and the ought six leaning against a tree outside of the tent, so somehow we talked Joe into belly crawling out of the tent to go get the rifle. We were scared, I tell you. The next day and night, the storm continued to blow. We saw several black bears on the salmon stream at the head of the lagoon during the evening hunt, but had no chance for a shot. We didn't talk about what happened last night. Too embarrassed, I guess, to be scared by a black bear that sounded like a man. We got back to camp early, built a big fire, sat around it, and ate dinner until around midnight. In August, there's still some light in the sky until about 10 or 11. I recall that we were all embarrassed about being afraid about the coming night. We had a flashlight and the rifle in the tent between us, locked and loaded. I finally dozed off, but woke right up when Dennis squeezed my leg. The illuminated hands of my watch showed it was 2.30. Joe was already sitting up and had the rifle in hand. I heard the first step, not more than about ten feet from the back of the tent. Slowly, then another, and another. Whatever it was, it sounded like it was walking on two feet. It made the same semicircle around the tent. When we finally got enough courage to crawl out of the tent and turn the flashlight on, we saw nothing. No tracks, nothing. The third night, we decided if it bothered us again, we would come out of the tent shooting. We were actually scared. It never came back the third night, and the following day we had a break in the weather and got the heck out of there. I never told anybody about the experience for several years, until about 1979, when I happened to be reading an old Alaska sportsman magazine published in 1935. In the letters to the editor, a woman wrote that she recently found a letter written by some distant relative of hers who was a school teacher at the cannery in Portlock Bay, a rugged fjord adjacent to Dogfish Bay. The year was 1905. She quoted from the letter. It said that the cannery employed a small group of Aleuts from a small village in Portlock Bay during salmon season. Their camp was about a mile from the cannery buildings. One day, all the Aleuts moved out of the village and paddled back to Port Graham. The letter said that the Aleuts claimed that a hairy man was bothering and frightening them to the point where they had to leave. I have since done some research into the subject and found written histories of natives from Seldovia to Port Graham being frightened and bothered by something. They even have a native name for it. It doesn't translate into English very well. These accounts mostly take place during the first half of the 1900s and are mostly native-related, but not all. I talked to one white guy who, in 1968, who got the bejeebers scared out of him while coming down an alder-choked gully while on a goat hunt in Portlock, Alaska. Most of these accounts come before the Bigfoot hype that began to appear in the 60s and 70s in the Northwest and Northern California. Well, anyway, that's my story. 
and I'm sticking to it. Ed. Turn Again, Alaska, 1955. My mother was one of 12 children who were turned over to an orphanage in Turn Again, Alaska, about 30 miles outside of Anchorage. There were no other children in this home, and it was apparently run or managed by a priest. In or around 1955, my mother would have been around seven years old. The bedroom assigned to the female children was in the attic, with an attic storage access door leading from either side of this bedroom. There were four children in this room, two of which slept on a bunk bed and two on a full-size bed. My mother was on the top bunk. The people who ran the orphanage had started saying to the children that if they saw or heard anything upstairs in their room, to wake them immediately and they would kill it. My mother's sisters had told her several times that if she ever saw the creature to not be afraid, it would not harm her. She thought they were just trying to scare her. One night, my mother was awakened by a noise. As she looked down from her top bunk, she saw a small creature walking upright across the room. She described it as no more than two and a half or three feet tall, shaped like a human, completely covered in very dark, long hair, with limbs not disproportionate with its body. Because it was night and she was only able to make out features as the moonlight through the window allowed, she was not able to clearly see its face, hands, or feet. She watched this creature in terror while it walked about the room. She saw it struggling to reach the covers on the lower beds to apparently cover the children up. When the creature started trying to climb up to the top bunk where my mother was, she yelled, stay away from me. When she did this, the creature appeared shocked that she was awake and that she had yelled at it. It stopped its attempt to climb the bunk and was later seen by my mother trying to take the skeleton key out of the bedroom door. It apparently really wanted that key because it stood there for a long time trying to get it out of the door, but never succeeded. She did not see the creature leave the room. However, one of the attic storage doors was out of her line of vision. A few weeks later, the children were told to bring some army rations out of the attic storage space. When they went to retrieve them, they found several ration cans opened and discarded in the far corner of one of those spaces. She thinks there were more than 12, but less than 20. None of the children had reason to sneak food, so they were not likely suspects for the presence of the empty cans. That was the only encounter my mother had with the creature, much to her relief. My mother was adopted when she was nine and taken from her siblings to Oklahoma. She never again saw or spoke to her siblings until 1997, where she had a purely chance encounter with her older brother at a tribal meeting. When they were talking, they did not know they were siblings until one of them mentioned having grown up in an orphanage in Turnagain, Alaska. It didn't take many more sentences after that for them to learn that he was the child born before her. Within hours of this meeting, while they were still talking about the orphanage, I asked my uncle if he remembered seeing the creature. His face lit up and he described in detail the same creature my mother had. They had only been talking for a few hours and did not have time to coordinate a fabricated story. Tina Clark Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.